Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Chuck Smythe. I'm the director of the Culture and History Department at Sea Alaska Heritage <coughs> Institute. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to a lecture today by Victoria Wiley de Echeverria. And she is a uh, visiting scholar. She will be speaking on on looking, linking interactions between cultural and biological diversity on the Pacific coast of North America in the face of climate change. We're very pleased to have Victoria here. She's been here about a month and a half and she'll fill you in on all of her work. Uh, she was a student for her bachelor's and master's of science at the University of Victoria studying under Nancy Turner, who's a very esteemed ethnobotanist and plant ecologist, and that those were the topics you were working under her with. Uh, Nancy's done a lot of work on the coast of British Columbia and in, uh, I always want to say Ontonagon, but it's the uh, Okanagan area of British Columbia. I didn't even know what you were going for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a long story. But uh, so Victoria has been here working with us and do, mostly doing field work um, and she's been working on her PhD dissertation uh, field work looking at uh, the effects of climate change and how that has impacted uh, subsistence practices and ability to travel throughout villages here and indigenous homeland areas and um, she'll fill you in she's going south after here to continue the work in southern southeast Alaska and northern British Columbia and we want to hear about crab apples because she was kind of focusing initially on crab apples as a, as a keystone species uh, to, to track climate change and how things have been uh, been modified uh, over over the last you know hundred years or so so please welcome and thank you thanks Chuck <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, if I'm not talking loud enough, oh, I guess I have a microphone on, never mind. <laughs> I was going to say, if I'm not talking loud enough, please let me know, or slow enough. But um, yeah, as Chuck said, I'm, I'm here doing my PhD research. So I'm currently at the University of Oxford with Tom Thornton, who some of you might know. He's worked here a lot um, on herring stuff, particularly, um, and with a lot of people in the area. So first off, I would like to acknowledge that we're on Klingit territory and um, thank the people here who have welcomed me to their communities. I've been to a couple small ones and, and just everyone's made me feel very welcome and I really appreciate that. Um, so today, uh, I'm, I'm still in the middle of my field work. I'm, I've been here for a month and I still have another just over, just under two months left. So I have lots of interviews and data floating around in my head, but nothing's been analyzed yet. So I'm mostly going to talk about um, what ethnobiology is and the discipline and what that's what I study and how that's different from other things. And then a little bit on my master's work, which is what got me into this and the background of my PhD stuff. And then I have a few slides at the end kind of talking about general impressions that I've gotten so far. But I'll have to come back in a year or so when I've actually analyzed some more data and present again. So ethnobiology is a field that studies the interactions between people, the biota, which are so the plants and animals and the landscape, and the environment. So um, also the rain, the tides, and things that are governed by life and not life. In the early days, um, ethnobiology, one of the first subdisciplines of ethnobiology was ethnobotany, which is a study of how people use plants. There's also ethnozoology, ethnoornithology, ethnoentomology. Um, it's just working with people in different, different types of organisms. I myself train as an ethnobotanist, so I study plants, but I've broadened a little bit to look at um, larger ecosystems now. So in 1895, uh, a fellow named Harshberger defined a term called ethnobotany, which was this new subdiscipline he was, he was working on. And Richard Evans Schultes, who is considered the father of ethnobotany, was a um, researcher who worked in the southern US and Central and South America. And he was one of the first people to really take this into the university and then go and, and actually go talk with people and, and merge these disciplines together. So um, 
Previously, a lot of ethno a lot of ethnobiological work has been cataloging and documenting. So people would go and and interview people about what plants and animals they were using and how they prepared them. Um, Franz Boas was a very famous anthropologist up here who was one of the four runners of, of ethnobiology in the Pacific Northwest. And so you can get lots of ethnobotanies or ethnozoologies where things are, are listed and they're cataloged on what people use. But, but now um, in, the new, in the field it's merging into trying to look a little bit more at interactions and see how people have managed their landscape, how they've taken care of it, kind of like how we're moving into the future also. So ethnoecology, which is a, another subdiscipline of ethnobiology, looks at documenting, describing, and understanding how people, mostly indigenous people, but also local people that have lived for a long time in one area, such as the fishermen in the Maritimes of Canada, who have lived there for seven or eight generations, um, perceive, manage, and use the whole ecosystem, and how different plants and animals interact with each other and interact with people. So why is ethnobiology important? Um, it brings together knowledge from several disciplines to answer research questions. So for example, some of my work is anthropological based, which is what I'm doing here. I'm interviewing elders about how they're noticing the weather changing and how that's affecting food harvesting and food processing. Um, and then to look at the question from a different dimension, um, people use biology, um, GIS, geology, geography, genetics, uh, other disciplines to kind of look at the question from, mul from multiple sides. So in my previous research, in my masters, which you'll see, I looked at taxonomy, which is how people characterize the plants or animals. So it's how species are described and, uh, and anthropology for interviews. So I was looking at describing uh, the Pacific crabapple, which I'll talk about, and then how people view the Pacific crabapple. Um, in this work, I'm looking a little bit more at geography and GIS and, and mapping how the weather has changed and how the landscape has changed, and then looking at how that people on the landscape are seeing those changes and how that's affecting them. Um, in ethnobiological research, you talk to people that have lived in an environment um, for generations, um, in some cases time immemorial, about their knowledge of the landscape. It acts as a bridge to look at issues from both local and broad scale perspectives. And it's one way to incorporate local people into conservation, land management, and other um, aspects because it's asking them about their knowledge and then that can contribute back to, to other forms. Um, sometimes there's a disconnect between social sciences and hard sciences or scientific or Western science. And um, people's observations aren't always viewed as being legitimate. And so by, by recording people's knowledge and kind of helping connect that, it, it helps um, bring people into being in control of their environment from a governmental <coughs> perspective as well. Um, and then also you, uh, you learn which species are both culturally and ecologically important. So moving into the future, seeing how we can adapt. Um, so cultural and ecological keystone species is one of the things that I'm looking at. Um, a cult uh, ecological keystone species is a concept that was developed quite a few years ago about um, a species that is, is, has a larger impact on its environment in proportion to the number of organisms that are there. So um, maybe it's not the most common species, but it, it's a pivotal species for other species depending on it. And cultural species was adapted from this concept to show a species that have really high cultural importance to various groups of people. So a good example here that everyone knows about would be salmon. Salmon is a prime keystone species, but there's several other species that are important as well. The species that I'm focusing on um, is Pacific crabapple, or Malus fusca, is its Latin name. Molks is its name in Smaliak, which is the language down of the Shimshan people, and mostly in BC. Um, is the name, I know I butchered it, I'm sorry. Harold, can you say it? What? The crabapple in Clinket. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> something like that uh, in, in Clinket, and then K A in Haida, 
are its, are its indigenous names. And um, Pacific crabapple is a native tree. It is, you'll see a picture of the fruit in a minute, but it, they think it came over, it's more closely related to the Asian crabapples. So there was some trade happening between here and Asia, which would have brought it over. Um, and so it's not as closely related to the wild crab apples in the center of the country, um, in o Ohio, Manitoba area. Those crab apples are more closely related to the crab apples in Europe. So that's interesting. But this plant has been here for thousands of years, and people have <laughs> used it a lot. And thank you for reminding me. I actually made some crab apple jam, which is here, and there's some pilot bread to put on. So I, since it's the lunch hour, you can pass this around and, and try a little bit. These crab apples were actually harvested down in Hartley Bay, British Columbia, and I've had them in the freezer for a while, but I finally got together and made some jam out of them, so enjoy. Um, this is a picture of the fruit and leaves of crab apples. So they're quite small. The crab apple fruits are about the size of the first joint of your pinky finger. And, um, and then the leaves are slightly different from domesticated apple leaves. These ones look a little bit more similar, but you can see in this, they have um, larger teeth. So it looks a little bit more like a mitten, if you think of it. It's got two large teeth on either side at the base, and then kind of goes up to smaller teeth. Um, another characteristic of the wild crab apple is here, if you notice, it's not like a domesticated apple where it doesn't have the little brown sepals that are left over from the flower. Half of the crab apple species have the sepals left on and half of them don't. So our domesticated apple is, comes from crab apples in the Tajikistan area and also has some genetic components of the European crab apple. But these ones, because they're from the Asiatic side, they don't have that. Um, for the biogeographical background of crab apples, these red dots, um, for my masters I did uh, historical, I looked into all the historical background of crab apples, and these red dots show its range based on herbarium specimens. So I looked in herbarium databases um, from Alaska, BC, Washington, um, all online, all of these are online. You can search for a plant name and they'll give you the distribution maps. And so these are areas where crab apple has is grown and has been cataloged, usually in university herbariums, which is a herbarium is a collection of dried plants, um, but sometimes in state museums or something. So these red dots show that distribution, and these purple circles show the areas where First Nations, as they're known in Canada, or um, American Indians in the US, have used it in the literature. So from these um, ethnobotanies that I talked about, where people had cataloged what plants different groups of people use, um, I looked through these, these books and found all of these areas where people had mentioned that crab apples had been used. Um, ecologically, crab apples are important because they grow near the water. So they grow in bogs and estuaries along river banks, um, sometimes on the edges of rocky islands. And so one potential, they have been shown a little bit, or people have talked that they uh, stabilize banks and maybe decrease erosion. Crab apples are not a species that many people have looked at. Um, it's just something that kind of caught my eye a long time ago when I was an undergraduate, I went to a talk by my, the woman who became my master's supervisor, Nancy Turner, who Chuck talked about. And she mentioned that several plants had had different varieties to different indigenous people, and that they had a more specialized um, view of these species than Western science did. And crab apples were one of those. And that, for some reason, it just caught me, and I fell in love with crab apples. And so that's what I'm, I'm looking at. And not many people have looked at crab apples. <laughs> they are also food for non-human animals, such as bears and crows. Um, deer is another one, which I forgot to put on here. Um, for a bear, um, some people probably have been hearing about the studies where they've looked at nutrient transfer from streams up into the forest. So bears take salmon from the streams and they carry them into the forest, and then those nutrients go into the trees. And it creates a cycle and connects the land and the sea. And crab apples, because a lot of bears, well, bears eat a lot of crab apples, this is another way that, that bears are able to sustain themselves um, while they're eating the salmon. So um, this picture, even bears like crab apples. There's a little baby black bear in the top of a crab apple tree in that picture. And this is a picture of some bear scat, which is filled with crab apples. It's 
was it was it was eating. Um, I'm not sure if anyone saw the National Geographic article. It was about two or three years ago, I guess, where um, there was a guy that went up and took pictures of the spirit bear in British Columbia, which is near where I did my <coughs> master's work, and. He has a picture that has been publicized a lot in BC now of this white bear reaching out, trying to get this crab apple, and it's on the tip of the branch, and it's like, ah. <laughs> so, um, and then ethno um, ecologically, um, crab apples are important to people. They were used from, from looking at the data in the literature, they were important in trade and as both a food, material goods, and medicine. And they were also mentioned in mythologies. There are quite a few stories where people would be eating crab apples at feasts, or there was one story where people were running away from some invaders and they threw their comb behind them and it turned into a crab apple thicket. Because crab apples, if you've ever tried to go through one, they actually have thorns and spines, and it's quite painful to try and d dig your way through a thicket. So um, this, these are actually yew wood, but um, crab apple is a very hard wood, so it was used for digging sticks. Um, handles of adzes, um, fish hooks, things like that. A similar thing that you would use a yew tree for. Um, the bark is usually what was used for medicine, so it was made into tinctures or um, decoctions or tea and drunk, or it was um, used as a poultice for skin irritations. And then this, um, this picture is a earring that I bought from a carver, uh, well, a, a jewelry maker in Hartley Bay, and it shows a spirit bear and it's a crab apple branch. And he, this is his own personal design, and I bought a <coughs> pair of earrings from him to, to have myself. Um, 30, overall, 37 indigenous groups, all the way from Alaska to Oregon, use crab apples. So one interesting thing from the literature, you might have noticed, there were some spots where crab apples grow down, they grow all the way in California, but I couldn't find any records in the literature of people that use crab apples. So that's another, at some point, I'd like to investigate that and, and figure out why that is. Um, several varieties were recognized. So four different nations that I know of, um, all in British Columbia, recognize more than one variety of crab apples. So if you notice when I talked about crab apples in the beginning, um, it's considered to be one species by botanists, by Western science. But these people have different varieties. And there's one that's really sweet, um, a couple that are quite large. There are some that are different colors. So um, not that everyone necessarily recognizes different varieties, but it's, it's interesting that some people did, and they use this plant enough that they could tell small differences between different crab apples growing in different places. Um, also, people managed crab apples. Um, they would trade them. It was very important trade for oolican grease for some people. Um, they moved them places. There are several old village sites where it's a, been documented that crab apples are growing quite close, which is kind of outside of their normal habitat because it's not near water. Also, crab apples tend to only grow on the west side of the mountain range that goes down um, the coast and, uh, coast and Cascade Mountains. But there are several locations near old village sites where it's inland in BC particularly and probably indicates that people would have moved it. And some crab apple orchards were owned by some people, or uh, taken care of by some groups of people. Um, so I, I mentioned briefly, Western classification only has one species. Um, its range is from Alaska to California, and it's primarily considered coastal, like I mentioned about the mountains. But for the Gitgat, who are the people I worked with um, for my masters, they have five or six varieties, as done by previous research. And people could tell them apart by how the fruit looked and where they were growing. And then also sometimes they're found inland and by village sites, like I just said. Um, there's uh, Black in 1994 published an article about how you could tell a plant had been moved in s instead of just appearing somewhere because, say, a bird carried it. And her four criteria for having human movement of plants was that it was near prehistoric or historic sites, such as village sites. It had a higher than normal density. It was occurring outside of its expected range or habitat. And it was associated with unexpected um, assemblages, so unexpected species of other plants. So for example, there's a spot which I'll show you a map of, or a picture of here. This is in the Kitsikalem Canyon in British Columbia, which is inland from Prince Rupert on the highway. And this, it's very overgrown, but these are crabapple trees and hazelnut trees. And they're growing together, and they don't usually grow together. 
Um, in this site, there's to some terraces were, were built by people, and there's, um, I think you guys might call it wild rice, but it's fritillaria, so lily, grows in, in uh, estuaries and stuff. We call it rice root in British Columbia. Um, it's growing down on the lower level, and then you've got crab apples and hazelnuts, and you have a whole range of culturally important species all growing together. Um, and this would be an example of one of the crabapple orchards where people might have moved more crabapples close together. Um, this is a crabapple orchard from Kumshiwa in Haida Gwaii, and you can see these are quite large crabapple trees. If, if you've seen crabapples in the wild, sometimes they're a bit straggly and, and small, but a lot of these crabapples that are growing near village sites or where people harvested show that they're slightly uh, more ordered, more larger, and, and probably were, well, definitely were, were used by people and managed. So my master's work, um, just present it quickly, um, as an example of how you can bring two disciplines together to learn about uh, a question. So my research objectives were to investigate the folk classification system. So that's the classification system of people that live on the land and the in-depth ethnobotanical uses and the cultural significance of molks. So how people view this plant in, in their culture. And then from the Western science side was to examine the botanical and ecological characteristics of each of the folk varieties that was told to me by people to determine if the differences in each of these varieties could be detected if I use scientific methods. Um, so the location of my research, as I said, was in Hartley Bay, BC, um, which isn't really actually that far from here. So um, they've cut off Alaska since this is a BC map, but what we're right up, I guess, opposite N or something, right? About where the N is. Um, so Hartley Bay is there. It's quite close to Prince Rupert. You can only get there by um, float plane or by ferry, like several of your smaller communities here. Um, there are no roads in. But uh, one cool thing about the village is it's all boardwalks. So people don't have cars that they shipped over. They have little ATVs and golf carts that they ride around in. And it makes it really bumpy. You'll get some places where the boards are straight this way. And it's like, oh, and then you'll get a bumpy. It's like, <laughs> um, this is a map of the Gitgats traditional um, territory. So people currently live in Hartley Bay. And that was the village site that was assigned to them. And it was their winter village site, traditionally. But they would travel all the way down into this area in the spring to get halibut and seaweed, and then travel up into that area in the fall to get all of the berries and the deer and the moose and everything else that they would harvest. Um, I'd also like to take a minute to acknowledge some of my elders that I worked with. I don't have pictures of all of them, but here's a few of them. And I really appreciate all of their time and also Everyone I talked with here, one elder that I talked with is, is in the audience. And um, yeah, your picture, or other people's pictures will be up here when I have sorted through all my current data. <laughs> so um, the first part of my research will, um, was on the ethnoecology of the crab apples. And um, these are just the dates I was in the field. My first field season was in the fall of 2011. And I used poster maps to have people tell me where different crab apple spots were and did semi-structured interviews. I talked with seven elders and two adults about their knowledge on crab apples. And then in the fall of 2012, I went back to the community again and had some follow-up interviews because I had some questions that hadn't quite been explained the first time. And I was able to visit the site where they harvested crab apples and where all of the varieties were found. And that's when I collected my ecological samples for that part of my data. And then in, the, in these, in 2012, in two different times, I transcribed all my interviews and coded and, coded and sorted the data, which is what I'll be doing in my PhD as well. Um, uh, and just kind of seeing what everyone has said and making, making the range of, of answering the questions that I asked people. So my first result was the number of varieties um, and what their distinguishing features were. So as I said, there was one variety that was very sweet. So the top one here, I guess a C, which had a very long stem, and that's why it's translated as, as long legs. It was sweet um, and a long stem, like I said, very small. And this one was one that, pe one that people said they would kind of eat off the bush, and they really enjoyed eating it. Um, Bo'ox, which is the second one, is um, it, it means it's a word that is a move in a game of marbles. So they kind of 
were likening the crab apple to a marble. And they were quite larger. And this one was very important um, because it was used in, um, in feasts. This was the main one that was used mixed with oolican grease and other berries for feasting times. And then um, the other ones, so Grama Dolce Volks, um, was a patch of Volks which was slightly different and had belonged to a specific person and had been passed down and people knew who, who had it now. And then the other ones, they grow in slightly different areas. Um, the smolks means uh, real crab apples. So some just means kind of every and molks is the crab apple obviously. And so this is kind of like the catch-all category. So if a crab apple wasn't counted in one of the other groups, it was just the smolks. Um, they didn't have every single crab apple tree all over their territory named necessarily because some places weren't really important. But in the fall harvesting camp, they had these different varieties. And then Dick One is the term for overripe fruits. So I'm not sure if, if anyone here has seen it, but when crab apples um, have a frost, they, the skin stays solid, but the inside turns to, to pu the pulp and is really juicy. And so the elders um, in Hartley Bay and other places in, ter in Shimshan territory um, like to suck the dick one. And it, they say that it cuts your tongue because it's so sour, but they love it. And um, n domesticated crab apples don't do this. When they rot, they tend to just mush. But the wild crab apples, and they said this is the only fruit that does this, the skin stays intact enough that you can kind of carry it with you, and then you can suck the juice out without sucking the skin. Um, hello? There we go. Um, these, are, these are just a few pictures uh, of not necessarily the specific varieties, but just to kind of show the range of what can be seen out there. Um, and crab apples can be influenced by lots of things too, like the ripeness um, where they're growing. Um, I, I asked people about how they harvested the mulks, and traditionally they would have used cedar baskets, um, probably very similar to here. Nowadays, they tend to use burlap sacks or, or buckets or things like that. Um, you can see I'm using a canvas bag. And this is an elder showing um, the crab apples that we harvested together. They were picked in clumps with the leaves to protect them. And crab apples are a very hard fruit. So it's much easier to pick a lot and keep it um, and bring it back to a camp to preserve. Blueberries tend to squish a little bit um, easier. So oftentimes, they would they would harvest this towards the end and maybe even process it back at the fall camp because they could travel with it. So when they were picking, there were some rules of, of what you did, such as you don't break, break the branches, you don't cut down the trees, and you pick with, in groups to protect yourself from bears, as we saw. Bears also like crab apples. Um, to prepare and store the mulks, um, fruits were usually picked green and then ripened off the tree. When people were ready to process them, they took off the leaves and then they would boil them um, and lightly and then pull the stems out and then reboil and make their jam or mix with other fruit or however they were going to eat them. Um, preparation types, I talked about this briefly. Different um, types of crab apples were used for different things. So there were five ways that crab apples were preserved. Um, Molks were, were mixed with oolican grease in this case, which is the traditional fashion in which they were, they were eaten um, centuries ago before people were jarring and making jam. People make thick jam, which is what I passed around to you all. Um, so the whole fruits are still there in a thick syrup. Preserves, which is more similar to when we buy peaches, so the crab apples are floating in a light syrup rather than being baked into, uh, cooked into a jam. Mass jam, which is again whole berry, but the berries have been smashed up a bit more. And then jelly, which is, of course, when there's no fruit left and it's just the juice that's been turned to jelly. Um, so ownership and management, I asked people about how they took care of crabapple areas. Um, these are two pictures from near the fall camp where all the crabapples are. So each of these trees is a crabapple. You can see there was this big, flat estuary area, and there are just crabapples scattered throughout it. Um, and people talked about how sometimes when they'd pick apples, they'd leave a few on the ground. And they also wouldn't pick all the apples. So this would have allowed more crab apples to grow in these areas where they were picking. But one thing I did notice was that um, people haven't been picking these crab apples probably for at least 15 years and sometimes a bit longer in some of the areas. 
And the crab apples are looking a bit unkempt. So they look almost like they've been snapped off. And I'm guessing that if people were still harvesting, um, the tree, it's, it's kind of like when you abandon a garden. Um, the trees are used to having people interacting with them. And so, um, yeah, there was a lot of really small growth. And then the larger trees have been snapped off. So just an interesting observation. And I'm not sure exactly what it means yet. But um, these are some other pictures of the banks um, on the river near the fall harvesting camp. You can see there's a huge thicket of blackberries. That's the picture you already saw on this. And any place where there is a small, grassy, flat area along the river, there were crab apples growing. Um, so uh, crab apples, I, I mentioned, were, were moved and traded. So several, uh, there were three instances where people told me that they brought crab apples to Hartley Bay, which is their winter village, and they grew up, um, particularly the sweet crab apple, because people wanted to have that one in their yard. So this is a picture of what the sweet crab apple looks like. And it's a little bit smaller than the, than the other crab apples. And this is a tree that was growing behind one of the oldest houses in the village. And unfortunately, when I went back um, the year later, someone had cut it down because they dug up this whole area. But um, I'm hoping that maybe the stump was still there. And I was going to check when I'm back again and see if it's, see if it's come up. Um, I mentioned that crab apples were traded. So they were traded to the interior. Um, they were traded to the Heisler people at Kitimat for Ulican grease and were sold to people um, as well. So um, one thing that I discovered in my interviews with it, there are lots of changes. So changes in use, so technology, like I mentioned, baskets are different. Um, people have freezers, like I froze these ones here. Um, and that's true up here too. People, as you know, people are using different things than they used 150 years ago because we don't have um, we didn't have freezers back then. So there are changes in technology. Um, there's changes in the weather. So people were saying that there was a lot of bad or unpredictable weather happening. There's high rivers. The fruit's not ripening. And this was a factor for the amount that they could harvest. Um, some people said that because they weren't picking and managing the crab apples, that um, there was a poor output and bad quality because the crab apples are used to being cleaned up. Um, one elder mentioned that he thought that in his lifetime the water levels had risen almost 50 centimeters and that worried him. And some people mentioned that varieties are disappearing, particularly the ones, those, the sweet one grows very low close to the water. And some people said that there were some areas where it had disappeared and they, they, this worried them. Um, and so that's kind of what led me on to my PhD to look at changes and, and ask people about what changes they're noticing and how that's affecting them. For the ecology and morphology of crab apples, in the fall, as I said, this, my second field season, I harvested crab apple fruits that were people said were different varieties and had them identify them. So I collected fruit from 27 different trees. And I measured tree and habitat characteristics. And I collected samples of the fruits and leaves, which was also for genetics. Um, I collaborated with a fellow who was doing his PhD at the same time. And he was doing the genetic range of crab apples from Alaska all the way to California to see how they were related to each other. So I sent him my samples um, to see if maybe there was a genetic imprint of people <coughs> managing. But unfortunately, he didn't have enough samples to really draw any kind of conclusion that way. So. Um, that's definitely something that could be looked at because there are several species, such as ones that show different varieties, that might be kind of on the way to domestication possibly, but didn't quite get there. Um, and they might have a different genetic signature. So then um, in the preceding um, year, I measured the fruit and leaf traits, and I, I did some statistics on those measurements. So for the ecological characteristics, I wanted to see if the different varieties were growing in different places based on the habitat that was around each tree. So I recorded the different species that were growing in each area. Um, and the purple circle are the trees downriver, and the red circle are the trees upriver, which kind of separated some of the varieties. But there was an a lot of overlap. So it looks like the habitat is fairly uniform through the whole river system, um, so that not much can be seen in, in that way. Um, morphological characteristics. This, uh, this correlation shows uh, fruit length and fruit width. And so this is each 
um, the mean of each tree. So I measured a whole bunch of fruits and then calculated the mean and, and standard deviation from that um, scattered throughout here. So these, these two um, were the two trees that were identified as Gassaci. So you can see they're quite small. And then, and it's statistically different. So as long as these bars don't overlap, that means that it's, it's different enough for statistics to pick it up. But in some places, like these ones, that overlaps, and those are two completely different trees. So um, this is the whole range. And then some were quite big. You can see some are quite small. Um, almost all the fruit traits were positively correlated, which means that if a fruit is larger, it was larger in width and in length and in weight, which makes sense. Um, the only one that wasn't correlated that way was the stem length versus um, the, the length of the fruit, which was negatively correlated. So that means the smaller the fruit, the longer the stem. If it had been positively correlated, it would have been the longer the fruit, the longer the stem, which um, goes in with the small fruits with the really long stems. Um, more, uh, more morphological characteristics were comparing the fruit and leaf traits to each other. So there was only one significant correlation in this, in this group. So it showed that trees with longer stems had smaller teeth on the right side of the leaf. I don't know really what that tells me, <laughs> but it's, it's interesting. Um, so it's, it's something to look into uh, more closely and maybe look at more traits or a larger sample because um, different traits could be, co if, the, if these traits are correlated to each other, then if people see trees with really deep indentations, they would know that that's the sweet crab apple, but, um, but w w when it's not fruiting. Um, so, and then for morphological characteristics, I threw all these traits into a big pile, and it's called principal components analysis, and it tells me which trait is the most important. So the variability in this can be described with 33% with the first component and 59% with the second. So the first component was fruit weight, and the second component was fruit length. So this is telling me that if I measure those two traits, that will account for, it, for most of the variability. So it will let me know which um, group or which variety possibly the different crab apples are in. And then these are the, the top traits. Um, so my question was, can I use morphology to describe the folk taxonomy? So if I didn't talk to people at all about what varieties, could I measure a bunch of crab apples and figure out which variety I was looking at? So yeah, so I had the elders identify the trees, and then I plotted them out based on these two main components. So it was fruit weight and fruit length. And so these are all of them scattered throughout, and each circle represents a different variety. So the um, the two with the red circle around them right here, those are the two that were identified as a really sweet one. So those are different. Um, but a, rest of, a lot of the rest of them overlap a lot, and some are even separated, like that one and that one were both recognized as the same variety. So this shows that if you just measure fruit, you can't necessarily tell what the different varieties are. Um, and this is important because it shows that you can't just go in with some scientific techniques and learn the same things that you would learn from elders being on the landscape. Um, the elders have knowledge of some things. Elders and adults who, have, who harvest on the land um, have knowledge about things that you just can't find out with Western science, which is why I feel it's very important to, to look at both of them. So um, my conclusions from my master's were that I found five fault varieties. There were five methods of preparation with different varieties. Um, I, I recorded all these descriptions of ownership, the rules, the management. Um, trees didn't occur in different ecological habitats. And that there are slight differences among the trees, but it's not really enough to tell with just Western science. Um, another aspect that might have been influencing the uh, varieties of crab apples was the management issue. Because if a plant is moving towards domestication, and then um, stops, it will start reverting back more towards what's called a wild type, and it might lose some of its um, culturally important characteristics. So if people haven't really been harvesting this tree for a couple generations of the tree, it might start merging back together because people might have said, oh, this is a sweet one, we're gonna keep that over here and just keep propagating the sweet together. As those of you who, gar who garden know, you, you influence your plants in what seeds you save and what the next generation will be. So the importance of this work was documenting different varieties um, and looking at what's rapidly changing. 
So the weather, harvesting, technology, and knowledge loss. As I said, this led into my PhD, which I then moved to England to do, although I'm still working in this area. Um, partially why I went to England was because Oxford offers me some opportunities being at a, at a university. They have a lot of people come and give talks, which is really um, stimulating for me. And then my supervisor over there worked in Southeast, and I could see an opportunity to branch out from northern BC into Southeast Alaska and kind of cover this whole area. So for my work, um, I'm linking interactions between, as Chuck said, cultural and biological diversity as the climate changes. So basically what this means is what is the weather doing and how is this affecting people as they harvest and process food. So um, one of the elders that I worked with, who is now gone, um, com what this from her interview said, the ones, so the Gassasi, the sweet one, that were closer to the beach have all died off. There were some more Gassasi there, but they were shorter trees, and they're all wiped out now. There's nothing there. So it's a worry, and one thing that I'm learning about is it's not just climate, well, not learning. Uh, it's not just climate change that's affecting this. There's a lot of issues. There's development. There's logging ferry terminals, all sorts of things. Um, but climate change is a factor, and people are definitely feeling this. These pictures are from Hartley Bay, and there was a high tide. And the water usually is like maybe 10 feet down this steep bank. But it's come all the way up. And there's a, because this uh, community is in boardwalks and the tides come up, there it's all on pilings. Um, if the water levels rise a lot, and and it's really worrying for people how they're going to be able to get around. Um, for the literature background of my PhD, I looked at climate change literature um, in, various, in various areas um, in North America on the West Coast here, and then also other similar um, ecosystems. Biocultural diversity, so different studies that are linking um, the cultural diversity and the biological diversity together. Um, it's been shown in several areas that places with really high biological diversity have a high cultural diversity too, which makes sense because if people are living on the land and using different plants and animals, there are going to be more people where there's more plants and animals to use. And then I'm also looking at literature on cultural ecosystem services, which is um, it's a, an, an idea that was developed in the, <clears throat> in the 50s where um, it's looking at the services that we get from the land or the ecosystems that aren't money, directly money, but can be quantified. So for example, if you log, you chop down a tree, you have wood, and you're selling that wood, and that's worth a certain amount of money. But if you have a forest, you have water, better water quality, you have water filtration, you have air quality, you have carbon dioxide sink, other things that can't easily be put a monetary value on, but they're trying to put a value on it so that um, people realize that it's, it's also, you get a lot of money from not chopping down a tree in, in daily life. Um, one thing that hasn't been looked into as much with this commoditization, which is, it's good and bad. It's, it's good that things have been given a value that the economy understands, but it's also simplified things a lot. And one thing that it simplified is it doesn't really look at people's interactions with their land. So it has um, cultural ecosystem services are considered like sacred sites or um, aesthetic places, sacred groves. But it doesn't look at how people take care of the land so that it, it takes care of them. And the reciprocity and the respect that a lot of people that live on the land recognize and how they are one with the land. So I was looking a little bit into how people in this area um, interact with their environment in this way. Um, so my research questions for my PhD were, are people noticing changes in the weather? And if so, are these changes affecting how people harvest and prepare resources and travel around their territory? What are the linkages between cultural and biological diversity? So I'm getting at this from the different plants and animals that people have told me that they use and how that's changing. Um, how these changes will affect local people now and into the future. So I'm, I ask questions about how people, um, what changes people were seeing and, and what they thought the future would hold. And then Pacific crabapple, as my keystone species, I'm looking at how it was used throughout this region. Um, is it experiencing change and can it be used as an indicator species to look at different areas? 
Um, my field areas, uh, this season I'm not going up to Chugach, um, but it's a future site potentially. So I've started up here in Juneau, um, uh, Cake and Huna. I'm moving towards down towards Ketchikan um, Thursday and going to Prince of Wales Island. And then I'm going down to Prince Rupert to work again with the Gitgat and the Haida on Haida Gwaii. So I kind of have this, this region of the world covered. Um, for my methods, I'm combining traditional ecological knowledge, so again, those anthropological techniques, and then looking at environmental time series data. So I'm looking at records of rain and snowfall, tidal heights, temperature, glacial movement, to see how the land's been changing in the, um, in the numbers record. So my interviews, um, I collected, I asked questions um, to learn from elders how the weather's changing, um, how what services they get, so whether it's you know picking berries or, or harvesting salmon, what resources they use, how it's changing, all that stuff. And then for the environmental time series data, which will be happening next summer, um, I'll be looking at aerial photos and weather data and kind of seeing how things have changed in, in that record. Um, for the analysis, I'll be merging both these data sets together, so I'm in no way validating indigenous knowledge or saying, oh, they must be right because the science says the same thing. I'm just looking at it from two different ways for how we can describe it. So my results to date, which is the shortest part of my presentation, because as I said, I'm in the middle of everything. Um, I visited Huna. I had 16 interviews there. And I had nine interviews in Cake. And in Juneau, I've had six so far. And I have, I have about three more in the next few days coming up, um, people that I'm talking to. I still um, I have to visit Ketchikan, Heidelberg, and Klawak, which is where I'm heading on Thursday for a week. And then, as I said, going down to Prince Rupert. Um, so Prince Rupert, Old Masses, Gitigit, and I forgot to put Hartley Bay on here as well. So my findings, very generally, is that there have been quite a few weather changes. Um, some of the things that have been noted, particularly by people, are is, is that the glaciers are melting and receding, and there's less ice floating in the bays. Glacier Bay was a good example of this, where the glacier has really retreated a lot. Um, there's less snow now than there was when people were young. People describe snow being up to the eaves. And now it's not as, not as deep. But some recent years had, ha has had a heavy snow. So um, I'm not sure yet what that means, obviously, but, or what um, is all going to come out of that. But there's fluctuation in year to year. But overall, the weather appears to be getting worse. Um, weather is un or worse or different. Weather is unpredictable, so sometimes it's hard for people to know when things are ripe or they get caught out in sudden storms that they weren't expecting because um, there's just some of the indicators that, that people have gone by for generations just aren't, aren't there anymore. Um, some people said there were warmer temperatures in the air um, or the water. Some places have higher tides, but then some places are rebounding because of glacial melt and so the rocks and shallow so rocks are coming up higher and boats are hitting rocks and shallow water is appearing where it used to be deep. So there are changes that people are experiencing and this is this is affecting them. For the changes in the plants and animals, sometimes people don't always know when to harvest things anymore because timing's different, so you have to watch a lot more carefully when things are ripe. Um, there are some plants that are indicated or plants or animals that are indicated by others. So when the salmon berry blossom came out they knew that it was time to harvest a certain species of salmon. But now, because of the weather changes, those don't always match up. So people are, are having to pay a bit more attention. The distributions and amounts and sizes of things have changed. So some people have said salmon are smaller recently. And this also has to do with overfishing, which is an impact. Um, so not, always, not all climate change, but uh, it's, a, it's a factor. Um, processing hasn't really changed that much um, because a lot of, in the last 70 or even 100 years, a lot of the processes have been the same, like jarring and, and canning fish. Um, but there are people that have noticed differences in, in using smokehouses and drying seaweed because of the lack of sun. Um, not quite as many species have disappeared, but some have declined. Um, deer was one that was noted that had declined a lot of places, salmon. Um, herring is a big one that's declined in a lot of places. And then some new species have appeared. So people have noticed, some people have found tropical fish. Um, small migratory birds have stayed for the winter. Um, in Huna and in Cake, they noticed that the moose are moving in, which is a mainland species. Um, sometimes they were moved there by people, and sometimes 
they um, swam over themselves. So um, for crab apples, so for my keystone species, I've found so far that they're not as commonly used in Cake, Huna, or in Juno as down south. Um, and part of my work will be with the keystone species will be just looking at differences in the species and by different people, um, which will be interesting. People up here often mention it as something their grandparents used. So that shows to me that it's a little bit of an older use and maybe people don't really use it as much anymore. Um, which is, is interesting. I don't know what it means, but maybe people down, if people down south move, use it more now, but people up here, there's more berry, there's, maybe you have more blueberries up here, so that's a more important berry for you, and down south they don't have as many. So that will be interesting to learn as I go down there. And I found a differing importance of crab apples, so <coughs> the, what I was just saying. So it'll be interesting to explore, because I'm doing a bit of a transboundary study. So looking at your people in these areas are all closely related through trade and family, but it'll be interesting to see how different plants and animals change in their importance as I move, move down the coast. Um, so the research outcomes from this work will be to facilitate indigenous communities to document their local climate change. So my work will be going back to these villages um, in a report for them to use in however, whichever way they want, and also to the people I talk to. Um, to combine quantitative and qualitative methods to enhance the dialogue between traditional knowledge and scientific research. Um, enhance predictive models of coastal environmental change and how this will affect the landscape, how people can change and adapt into the future and what they're going to be seeing. And then use a keystone species to indicate ecosystem changes due to climate changes. And this one is still being developed, but we'll see what happens as I continue learning about crab apples. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention and your time. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them and any discussion. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, so what, what's your biggest surprise? coming up here after the work that you've done down in BC? Like something that was unexpected or something that um, was a surprise to you? Well, I, I guess maybe I thought crab apples would be used more because it's in the literature. And I was like, oh, well, it's, it's, it's berry. People are going to use it. So that kind of has changed a little bit the way I'm approaching crab apples. Um, I think it's really important to record. One of the reasons I made my interview broader and talked about all plants and animals was because I didn't want to make it so specialized that it wouldn't be important to people. So by researching all of it, I'm creating this data, well, creating a, a database for people to then take what they want out of and expand further. But, you know, the crab apples is maybe a little less significant than I originally thought. Yeah. Have you found differences in use, like more jams versus jellies in areas or anything like that? Um, not so much. People use uh, all, all the, well, not, I shouldn't say all the types. People use jam up here, and also a few people have said they remember um, their grandmothers making, mixing it with grease and other berries. So it's, it's the same use that way. Um, I haven't found elders that remember enough specifics about crab apples to have as much detail about the varieties or, or like jarring uh, jelly versus um, preserves and stuff like that. But it seems relatively similar. Except seal grease is more common up here than ulican um, sometimes for berries. So, yeah. Yes, Chuck. I grew up on the East Coast and had obviously different kind of crab apples, but they were larger. So it, was, it struck me that these are almost more like berries. Yeah. So, I don't know if you had a comment on that, but I was curious if they're larger down in southern BC than up here. They're the same size in southern BC, but the species in the middle of the country are larger. So the crab apples from there are, are about what is that, like four or five times the size of the crab apple here? Yeah, but they're relatively the same size. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a berry or are some, like in the east, actually apple? Well, I'm, well I mean, okay, so uh, botanically they're fruit, um, but blueberries are also fruit because the fruit is just the reproductive part of the plant which is providing the seed, um, holding the seed. but. I call them berries because the people I worked with in BC class them in with berries. So they would pick blueberries, salmon berries, crab apples. Those were all considered berries to them. So I, I kind of slipped into that lingo. But 
all of these would be fruits. Yeah. Um, berry is a type of fruit, and not all berries are berries. So tomatoes are a berry. Um, blueberries are a berry. The salmon berries and blackberries and raspberries are all, um, uh, now I've blanked on it, aggregate fruits. Um, so each little, like when you look at a blackberry, each little ball is, is a fruit. And all together, they make a whole bunch of fruits together. Um, apples are called palms, P-O-M-E. And they're related to, so apples, pears um, are palms. Rose hips, which are in the same family, are not palms. They're different. Um, oranges, which is one of my favorite ones, are called hesperidiums. So they're the, the hesperidium has juicy sacs, which is what are the orange, the, the bits, pulp and oranges. So, so are some of these palms? Um, no. Oran uh, pa oh, or? Palms, yeah. So the apples east coast would be palms as well. So it's, it's, um, it's a way of describing and classifying different fruit types. Um, different characteristics of the fruit. So anything with um, leathery uh, seed capsules and then big thick flesh around is a palm. So when you think of slicing an apple it's on its side, it's got those like the star shape in the side with the seeds and then a big thick flesh. Um, yeah. But berries are actually a true berry, like a berry fruit is not very common. Um, we just have a few. So if you think of tomatoes, and they've got lots of um, lobes inside, that's if you slice the blueberry open and really look at the structure, it's the same way. But not all of our berries are, are berries. Yeah. <laughs> that's the complicated description. Yes, Harold? Uh, what part of season do you pick them? When are they ripe? They're ripe in kind of, well, different varieties sometimes have different ripening areas, but kind of from the middle, beginning middle of September to kind of the middle of October. Um, but that's going to depend on the weather as well, because I noticed when I was driving around a couple days ago that all the crab apples that I could see on, on the Douglas Road heading up north were all gone. The crab apple trees didn't have fruit anymore. And I've been gone in cake for the last week and in meetings. So I don't know whether or not they've ripened all of a sudden in the last couple of weeks, or if people came or if animals came and ate them, people harvested them, what happened? But it's it's a bit early for them because um, it should be a little bit later in September. The reason I said I wasn't familiar with uh, crab apple, it just mm -hmm. wasn't a statement for the type of people. Yeah, yeah. So it's I mean it's interesting because it's in the literature um, from Boaz and other people as being used up here, but maybe it was. Um, it doesn't talk about how often it was used. So the fact that it was used once is not differentiated from the fact that it's used all the time. So, yeah. What's the name of the sweet variety? And like, is it endangered or is it just um, certain <coughs> Yeah, so it's Gassa C is the way you say it. And um, there are some areas that people have said that it's disappearing, but there's also um, the, the same variety is, has the same name by another indigenous group. So um, I haven't talked to them, but maybe their crab apples, sweet crab apples are fine, which would maybe be a case of trade. Maybe they traded that variety and that's why they have it. I don't, it's, yeah, there's lots of questions about how things moved around that I don't know. Yeah. Yes. yes, I have a question. And if you don't want to answer it right now, you don't, you can think about it and you can get back to me. So we're all, I'm also involved in a study trying to, uh, trying to identify cultural keystone species from the perspective of the people who live in the communities in Southeast Alaska. So if you hadn't come to Southeast Alaska with this idea of studying crab apples, based on the interviews that you've already done, is there another species you might pick to look at? I think salmon berries. Salmon berries. Because blueberries are used a lot by people, um, but it seems like there hasn't been as much change. Salmon berries, there have been quite a few people that have said there are several years that have been really bad for salmon berries. And um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard without going, yeah, analyzing. But salmon berries have shown, I guess, a lot more change than the blueberries have. Well, maybe think about it. Okay, I'll let you know. And I'm more focused towards plants because that's my yeah. my background. So animals, herring, obviously, which a lot of people work on. Yeah, big. Yeah.
Or and then you, yeah. Um, well, I know there's a bunch of work on just climate change in general, specifically mm -hmm. on northwestern regions, but I was wondering if there's any other ethnobotanical research that you're aware of, and if so, if you're planning on, like, finding correlations or um, similarities between your research. Yeah, um, well, as Linda said, she's doing a study and she's gone to a few communities and done some interviews about how they're recognizing climate change. Um, so when that study comes out, which will be f before mine, I will be um, drawing links between them. The Organized Village of Kassan has done their own climate change work and they talk to people in Craig, Heidelberg, um, Kassan, and that might be it. Um, and they'll be coming out with a report at some point. I don't know how it's how open it is where it's going to be posted, but but I'll definitely be, you know, not as much work is being done talking to the elders themselves. There's a lot of climate change work being done from the governmental, a top down, but not as much talking to people. But yeah, I'll I'll link with whatever I find and whoever I talk to. Yeah. Uh, sorry. You had mentioned medicinal qualities earlier. Mm -hmm. What have you found like? What do elders use it for? For crab apples? Up here, no one's mentioned medicinal properties. They've only mentioned the fruit as food. Um, but there was a story that crab apple was in um, that was told to me by <clears throat> a fellow in Cake. And he said there was, I can't remember his name. You might know Harold. There was a very strong man. And he's on the totem pole ripping open a skate, a shark. Is it a shark? <coughs> duck. 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 Okay, and he, um, <coughs> what is he ripping open? What is he? A sea lion. A sea lion. And to train, <coughs> train himself, he ripped open crabapple um, things because it's a very strong wood. So he, he ripped open crabapple and then finally was strong enough to, to rip open the sea lion. So that was an interesting story. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. The tiny crab apples look mm -hmm. really similar to the high bush cranberries that we have here. Have mm -hmm. you looked at how closely related they are? Do you yeah, they're not closely related. The elderberries and high bush cranberries are related to each other, and then these ones are not. So the family that high bush cranberries in is called Adoxaceae, and this family is called Rosaceae, so it's related to roses. Um, serviceberry, if you know that one, it's not one that's not as common here. Um, uh, roses, apples, pears, plums, prunes, or plums, peaches, apricots, they're all related to each other. So, um, but yeah, it is, and it's something some people, a couple of times someone's like, oh yeah, yeah, we totally use crab up. Oh no, wait, I'm thinking of high cranberries. Um, and they are somewhat similar, um, but used in different ways, and yeah. Okay. Well, thank you awesome. again. Thank you.